Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call to order the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access Committee meeting of uh, Wednesday, August 16th, 2023. Uh, roll call, please. Chair Perkins? Here. Vice Chair McMichael? Here. Regent Arascata? Here. Regent Cruz Crawford? Here. Regent Goodman? Here. Regent Tarkanian? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. And Vice Chair McMichael, would you mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. And with that, I will do the land acknowledgement. Before beginning, we take a moment to recognize that here in Nevada, we stand on the land of the Washishu, Washo, Numu, Northern Paiute, Nui, Western Shoshone, and Nuwu, Southern Paiute. We take a moment to recognize and honor their stewardship that continues into today. With this recognition, we state an intention to rightfully include their voice and respect them as the 27 sovereign tribal nations of Nevada. And that brings us to a public comment. Is there any public comment in Reno? My name is Amy Payson, A-M-Y-P-A-S-O-N. I was a previous faculty senate chair at UNR and I'm the current chair of the Faculty Diversity Committee and I've been a member of that committee for the past four years. Today I'm speaking on agenda items five and six. First, I want to affirm the faculty's commitment to DEI, especially in hiring and retention. Our commitment to diversity is exemplified by the work of our Faculty Diversity Committee that, from its inception in 2016, has continually worked on charges related to hiring and retaining diverse faculty. I applaud the efforts of addressing implicit bias with anonymized review of applications. However, I am hesitant to support any system-wide proposal that would require all institutions to use the same program. I believe that our institutions should adopt policies and processes that address specific institution needs to meet our shared goal of making our institutions spaces of inclusion and belonging. An anonymized review of applications would be a step backward from where UNR is at in addressing implicit bias in hiring processes. For us, diversity awareness in the hiring process should be a comprehensive and and be throughout the whole hiring process, not just a one and done solution at the beginning. Specific to addressing implicit bias, implicit bias training is required of all search committee members, and we are working to make this training required of all of our faculty at UNR. Search committees use rubrics to score candidates with objective criteria from the job ad. Encouraged and practiced by many units is to include committee members outside their department or immediate work team to have someone with an objective eye on the process. In addition, diversity statements are required as part of all faculty job applications. Committees are encouraged to use diversity and inclusive workplace questions in each interview stage of the process, and committees receive an EEO report of the candidate pool and determine if they need to do more recruiting to diversify the pool before reviewing candidates. Additionally, FDC has worked with our HR to ensure that the university commitment to diversity statement is part of each job ad and not just on the job's homepage. We are encouraging all units to create and include Include a commitment to diversity statement specific to the school, college, or division to show candidates our strong commitment to DEI in a visible way. Moreover, each unit created DEI goals as part of a comprehensive DEI strategic plan, including goals specific to hiring and retention. A separate university committee, the Cultural Diversity Committee, created a resource guide to help encourage awareness and best practices with diversity in hiring. In all of the work of the Faculty Diversity Committee, we have aimed to make diversity awareness a norm of the hiring process, integrating throughout and not just as an add-on requirement. We have worked to ensure that any requirement of searches both help us achieve our DEI goals, but that also consider what can be implemented and what works for both academic and administrative faculty professional searches. This work is ongoing, and FDC is working to assess faculty demographic data but initial analysis shows we are making gains in this area. So thank you for understanding the work that we've done at UNR in this shared goal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Payson. Any uh, additional comments in Reno? Okay, and then we'll go to Great Basin. 
Are there any com uh, public comments in Great Basin? There, <clears throat> there is no public comment in Elko. Oh, thank you. Um, public comment in Las Vegas. No comment from Crump. Thank you. Bill Robinson, chair of the UNA Faculty Senate. I was worried that you weren't going to have any public comments, so I came over to make sure you had one. Um, I, just like my Reno counterpart, we have, we've established committees in the last few years to, to work on uh, diversity issues. We, and just like them, I have some concerns about how we would implement the blind. And for the, I, we talked before, the, for the, at the regential level and the higher level positions, I'm right there with you. But a lot of times what I've been successful in departments that have been having issues by being able to sit in that department and talk about their pool with them and talk about their who they interviewed compared to who was in their pool. And for example, what we're seeing now is we've seen departments allow, um, even though it's an entry-level position, allow experienced people to apply. Well, what happens then is in a lot of disciplines like mine, the older people all look like me and the younger people look more like you. And if, the, you, limit, if you put experienced people against inexperienced people in the pool, you end up more hiring people who look like me when you had high quality people available who look more like you. So there's one department that the last three hires have been white males. We had a chat. Some of the more senior faculty, they have problems of, and I probably do too, I just don't realize it because it's you know implicit bias. But you could hear them say things about the younger candidate pool that the women in particular in the younger candidate pool that they would never say about, they never say about the, the men. But the younger faculty understood, and the last three times that department has hired, they have chosen only to have brand new people able to apply, and they've hired two women and made an offer to a third who didn't accept. So that, to me, that's, we need to, we need to make sure that we leave our doors open, that, as she said, that we don't try to apply one one set somehow fixed standard that's going to sometimes. The other thing I want to say is in most of our areas on campus right now, I think the bigger problem is retention as opposed to we only have one year of data and fun. our new administration is much better. We got really good people hanging around to help us. But we had, we, we were in the past, we were denied the data to look at retention, really take a serious look at retention. We have one year of that data that we were snuck. And under the table, kind of. And 60% of the women that we had hired in that year were gone by the time their tenure applications came up, and only 20% of the men were gone. We only hired three black or Hispanic faculty that year. Two of them were gone by the time there. So a record of hiring, everybody says, oh, we are just as good promoting and tenuring women as we are at men, but the women are leaving before they get to that point. So I hope that we'll have a lot of emphasis. I know my time is up. I hope that we'll put a lot of emphasis onto the retention issue as well as onto the uh, hiring issue. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Any other comments here in Las Vegas? Okay. That, t are you, is this a public comment? Come on. <laughs> I didn't say state your name and um, spell your last name for the oh, record. I was on it too though. Uh, Vince Medina, M-E-D-I-N-A. I am here speaking on agenda item number seven, the CSN Back on Track program, and just wanted to urge um, support for this particular program and convey the power of the pathways that this program will provide for students in alternative education programs. These students are the ones that are traditionally the ones um, that, that struggle in a traditional school for a variety of reasons and that their cycle has been from generation to generation to struggle in school and to struggle in career pathways. Um, this kind of program will provide access and opportunities for these students, not only motivation to engage them to graduate high school, but also to engage them for what's next and those opportunities. Um, so I just wanted to uh, urge you to support this particular program as a school administrator in an alternative setting for a, a few years now. I've been able to see the impact um, when a student graduates for the first time in their family, 
but also understand the, the confusion that they may have sometimes about what's next when they don't have a reference point within their own family, within their own community, on how to go to something better than, than what they're accustomed with outside of their little four block radius. So this program will provide those opportunities um, and I just want to extend, I hope you support the program. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any further comments in Las Vegas? Thank you. And that brings us up to the minutes. Um, I'd like to entertain a motion to accept the minutes from the May 17th, 2023 meeting of IDEA. Motion to accept. That was motioned Second. by Regent Nick Michael and seconded by, was that Regent Tarkanian? Yes. Okay. Um, so all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I vote aye as well. Um, that motion carries, oh, any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Next, the chair's report. I don't have very much to say because we have a pretty packed agenda. I would just like to say the standard thank you to all of the people that helped um, to put this agenda together um, and the dedicated crew that um, to guide and direct and assist me in this important work specifically Mr. Tillery Williams and the IDEA Council for their continued um, support, advice, and engagement. I really, really appreciate you all. Um, I know it's hard for this committee because we're often flying, uh, flying against the stream of privilege. And um, some of those things, I know it's a hard committee to stay motivated um, when you're constantly going upstream. And I appreciate, um, like I said, the hard work that people put into it. And at the end of the day, our committee helps to serve our students better and um, a wider variety of students and be inclusive of those students and understanding of their um, individual as talents as well as their collective talents. And that is all from me. That's it from the chair's report. Um, do I need to do the introduction for the Vote Nevada Initiative? Actually, this um, it's uh, Dr. Sandra Cosgrove. She's a PhD and a history professor at the uh, College of Southern Nevada and an executive director for Vote Nevada. Um, this is, uh, it's gonna be comments about the recent Supreme Court rulings and, and their impact on higher education, as well as some other wrapped in topics, related topics. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so Dr. Sandra Cosgrove, I'm a history professor over at CSN. Um, I also have a small nonprofit that works on civics education in the public because I feel that's part of my job too um, as a public servant in Nevada. And I think probably most of you know me um, because I tend to be very public and I tend to be out there on TV explaining things and doing things. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm a very demure, shy person, not. Um, and so what I wanted to do, I uh, talked to Regent Perkins and I know that there's been a lot of students and there's been faculty who are really worried about the recent Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action. And unfortunately, what happens sometimes is the way the national news presents something is they make it sound like this is everywhere, that this case applies to every institution, it's everywhere, it's tragedy, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Which is rarely the case. And so the case that was just decided is Students for Fair Admissions, Inc. versus the Presidents and Fellows of Harvard College. So that was specifically looking at affirmative action policies at Harvard and the University of North Carolina. And so it was very specific to those two kind of elite Ivy League institutions. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the majority and wrote a student must be treated based on his or her experiences as an individual, not on the basis of race. So how does that apply to NG and the college and universities that we have here? It, it applies not at all to the community college. Community colleges are open enrollment, come and apply, we accept you, in you come. Nevada State University now is also open enrollment. You apply, you pay for your classes, you get to, to attend that college. UNR and UNLV have a 3.0 GPA rating, uh, SAT, ACT, advanced diploma. But if you can benefit from being at the university, they can waive some of those things or we send you to the community college for a semester and then we send you back over to the university. So the court ruling has zero impact on NG students when it comes to admissions. And so we're already doing what the US Supreme Court said 
Because if you look at what Chief Justice Roberts said after that first sentence, must be treated on the basis of his or her experiences as an individual, not on the basis of race. That is what we already do in NG. We look at people in totality. Who are you? What are your experiences? Um, you know, what can we do to help you? That's kind of the Nevada way, and it's something that we do not just in higher education. I spend a lot of time during election cycles especially making sure people understand why we elect judges, because sometimes people get very confused about that. But if you go to the Secretary of State's website and you look at the requirements for running for any office, uh, let's just say regent. I mean, it could say you need a PhD, you have to have taught a class, you have to have worked at a university, you have to have published a book, but that's not the Nevada way. Instead, we have very general requirements and we say, you bring yourself in totality and come talk to voters. And if voters feel that you in totality would be a good regent, then we'll elect you. We're not gonna say it has to be if you have these certain criteria. And so we apply that pretty much across the board in Nevada. And so anybody that's ran for office has also benefited from the fact that we just let people run and then the voters decide whether you're the right person or not. And so I've been telling my students and anybody that asks me, this is not going to impact us all at all here because we're already doing what the U.S. Supreme Court said was allowable. And so are there any questions about that? Because I know there was just a lot of students who were very upset about that. Any questions? Oh, 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 I see. Yeah, Charlton, so, Madam Chair, I just wanted to, to say thank you to Sandra for, you know, uh, dispelling any of the panic that people might be feeling. Um, we also know that the Department of Education has just recently um, shared their guidance as well that is uh, being articulated and, and we will be presenting this back to the full board. Um, probably at the October meeting, but really wanted to thank Sandra because I know she's very passionate and yes, she's very shy. Um, about speaking, especially in public, but I, I kid, but at the same time, um, we know that she is an advocate for all. And so really wanted to thank you, Sandra, but, um, but for the full board and for the committee, and as we know that this was a uh, new business, but wanted to thank you again for, for you. getting here soon and sharing and dispelling the rumors and, and the fear. Because I know there were reporters, I was watching them on Twitter, and they were like, oh my gosh, this is just terrible. And I was responding to some of them saying, this isn't gonna impact where I work at all. This is, no, this is, we're, we're in open access, y'all come take classes. And so you need, to, you need to stop scaring people that this is actually a very narrow group of colleges and universities that are being impacted. So for students in Nevada, they don't need to worry about this at all because we are already in compliance. Um. Are there any other questions from the board members or any members present? I have a question for you. Um, okay. To me, this is kind of related to the um, what heritage, um, and like the... The affinity groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. So how does that, does this affect that at all at, in Inchi? Nope. It doesn't. We're still pretty much doing the exact same things. We're doing outreach to different groups. We're doing cultural programming. We're making sure students feel comfortable. It hasn't changed anything related to that. Thank you very much. So the next thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about civics education. Because Nevada, it is, is not a good place when it comes to civics education. We have low voter turnout. We have low participation rates. We now have nonpartisans are like the largest group of voters in the state of Nevada, yet most of them do not participate. And what I find is when I, I reporters call me all the time because they don't quite understand sometimes what the legislature is doing. I literally go on TV and give out my email address and say, if you have questions, email me. Because people get very confused and then they don't participate. And so the mission of, of ENCHI includes making sure that we do public education. Yes, we're supposed to be taking care of our students. Yes, we're supposed to be taking care of the community. But in Enchi's mission statement, it also talks about faculty, the institutions, helping the public. And so I have to ask, why am I the only one doing it? Because if you look, if you look at the number of, I'm glad you did this. If you look at the number of people that come to me through Vote Nevada, they will ask me, why do we elect judges? How am I supposed to know who to elect? I don't know anything about a judge. Or they'll say, I don't understand the difference between a primary and the general election. 
somebody needs to help me. Or we just discover, because we're doing mail-in ballots right now, at the state level, 10,000 mail-in ballots were not counted because of an error that the voter made. It's usually not signing the back of the envelope, or they did something and then did not cure their ballot or fix it. So 10,000 people who could have used a little bit of help lost the right to vote because we didn't have voter education available. In Clark County, another 5,000 ballots came in after the deadline and were thrown out. 15,000 people lost their right to vote because they didn't have someone to go to to say, what am I supposed to do? When is this supposed to be turned in? I mean, I know with my students, sometimes they don't know who to go to when they have questions about this. But this is what I do in the classroom that I now do in public. And so after every legislative session, we do Summer of Civics for Vote Nevada, because I always have somebody that's like, what's the open meeting law? And I don't understand why things are chaos at the legislature. Or they'll say to me, okay, I don't, I don't quite understand what happens after a bill gets passed. How do I make sure that bill gets implemented? But I just open it up and say, what do you guys want to talk about? We ended up talking, um, uh, the Speedway that does NASCAR and everything, they just hired their first Latino um, communication strategist. And so I interviewed him because he wants the Latino community to know that there's jobs available up there. Uh, Kevin Rayford did a whole thing on entrepreneurship. And so I always open it up and say, what questions do you have? And I'll put workshops together. People have a lot of questions. And then in the, the election cycle, I always make sure that I'm doing lots of Zooms, lots of interviews on turn your envelope over and sign it before you turn it in or it's not going to get counted. And so I just want to say, I would like to make sure that I'm not the only one that's providing information or at least making sure that people know you can contact me if you have questions. And so every summer that we do this, I do it on Zoom, we do recordings, and I make sure that it stays so that people can watch them over and over again. One of the things that we did this summer, excuse me, which was a little different, is um, sports equity. Obviously, we had World Cup going on. The Women's World uh, Cup team was, did, had a very famous lawsuit where the women were not getting paid as much. They did not get the same type of services. But this kind of hit home because a lot of us, during the UNLV basketball season, um, we were still needing our basketball fix after the Aces won. So we thought, okay, we'll go over and watch um, the Lady Rebels. And we went in there, and there was no one there. It was empty, and we were sitting there. And we knew where the men were across over in Thomas and Mac that it was full. And we said, no, 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 uh-uh-uh. Because the men were losing, and the women were winning. And so a bunch of us showed up at the women's game and got online, and were tweeting at the Las Vegas Review Journal, and said, when you win, you go on the front page. You go on the front page of the sports section. When you lose, you go on page three. And so we, we expect that when women win, they go on the front page. It took us about three days of bombarding them, and then the women showed up on the front page. And so we're not talking just about Title IX. We're talking about basic capitalism and business investment. And so once we started getting the women on the front page, I have to say hats off to President Whitfield, because then he got behind $1 tickets to go in and $2 beer. And you know how long it took to fill up the arena after that? 30 seconds. Because it was when it was what you can get $1 and $2 beers, everybody came in. And then they started saying, if you go to the men's game, if you just walk over to the women's game, it's free, you can get in. And so we, may, we wanted to talk about, not again, we can talk about Title IX separately, but just from a capitalist perspective, when you win, you should get something for winning. I don't know if you've looked at the salary between the men's coaches and the women's coaches. Lindy LaRock was winning, pay her. You know, CSN has sports teams and no one says anything about them. And what I am finding, especially with my students right now coming out of CCSD, because they missed, because they were in the pandemic, they missed a lot of interaction and how do we get along with people. Sports is a good thing for them to be doing right now, but it needs to be equitable between the boys and the girls. There needs to be just as much investment in what the men's teams are doing as what the women's teams are doing. And to not do so is a business failure that you can pack that stadium if you just invest in the women a little bit. And so I'm not making an argument about Title IX, I'm just making a basic capitalist argument. If women win, they go on the front page and you pay them. And so that was something that we had a lot of people, one of the young uh, students that participated, he actually wrote an op-ed about that and it got published in the Nevada Independent about how the, there's a difference between how the Golden Knights were treated and how the Aces were treated. And so that was something that a lot of people participated in. 
But, but you know, I we talked about local reporting and how important that is. We talked about what is entrepreneurship. We talked about, you know, going to college. We have a lot of Nevadans who don't know where to go to get those questions answered. And so I'm just hoping that it's not just going to be me. It's fine. I can, I can do all this type of stuff. But at the community college level, community service is part of our evaluation. And it would be nice when we're looking at numbers about 605,000 people are now registered nonpartisan, but don't show up because they don't know what they're doing. They need to know that they can come somewhere and get their questions answered and feel confident as a voter. Um, I, I answer questions. Um, I teach people how to understand our kind of crazy legislative sessions because they get a little crazy. I also t teach people how to hold elected officials accountable, which makes me super popular with the political parties. Um, and sometimes you get pressured and I'm like, yeah, I'm tenured, so I'm going to keep doing it. But I think faculty need to realize there are people who really need them and they need to do out in the public the same thing they do in the classroom. So, any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. You should make Michael, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, getting back to the, the voting issue, uh, of those 10,000 uh, voters that weren't counted, how many were contacted to try and cure those votes? It's hard to estimate, but what we found when we started kind of, because um, I work closely with the Secretary of State's office, and so talking with Secretary of State Aguilar, trying to kind of figure out who are these people, what we discovered is that the Democratic Party contracted, contacted Democrats, and the Republican Party contacted Republicans, and if you weren't registered with the two major parties, it doesn't look like you were contacted at all. Okay, so a lot of those votes could have been independent? They could have been uh, nonpartisans, yes. Because Partisan. mm. nobody cared about them. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from any members or any, the, any of those in attendance? Uh, Regent Cruz Crawford. Um, go ahead, Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record, I just wanted to thank Dr. Costro for all of her work, um, especially in regard to our IDEA committee with uh, other committees that help support um, diversity, equity, inclusion, including ACLU, and helping with our um, um, equality work across the state. Um, and just being there for every single party member, no matter what party, to just get out there and educate. And so I really appreciate um, all the work, and it is, um, it is definitely seen. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when, when sometimes when people tell me they're afraid to come to a regents meeting because it's scary and stuff, I said, my biggest problem is I get to know all of you when you're running for office. And then my problem is like, what is Laura's last name? Because I just know, I just know it's Michelle. Because I, I get to know people during when they're candidates, and then I forget what the last name is. Any other questions from anybody here or uh, on screen? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I wish to echo what. Does somebody question? Uh, Chair Perkins, this is this is Regent Carvalho. Hey, Regent Carvalho. I, I just have one comment. Go ahead, please. Hello. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, encourage Dr. Cosgrove's work. Um, I, I really do appreciate what you do for the community. It's it it is seen, as Regent Cruz Crawford said. And I just wanted to give out a a, a thank you to you as well for really advocating on behalf of the. Uh, women's athletic teams here in Nevada. I, I, I see that as well. And I, I truly appreciate that. Um, sports, especially from the, the four year perspective, um, is changing very much, um, as we speak with NIL and, um, you know, with the Mountain West and, and all of that going on. Um, and I think that it, it would be wonderful if we could continue this conversation. Um, sports is, like you said, a, a, a community effort, and um, I appreciate your work on that, and I hope that we can continue this conversation. So thank you. Yeah, if, you, if you're my Facebook friend, you're probably sick of me posting about sports. Never, never, never. 
Um, thank you for that question. And I wish to echo what my colleagues have just said. Thank you. I appreciate the work. Yes, you are seen and definitely heard. <laughs> Great. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask if it's okay with legal, can we take things out of order? Can we go to um, the uh, item number seven, CSN back on track program, and then come back to the regular agenda? Well, uh, Deputy, Deputy General Counsel Carrie Parker, for the record, yes, that's up to your discretion, Chair Perkins. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Um, take, skip to number seven. CSN back on track program implementation, and this is for information only. And Sarah Quintana, manager of the early college programs from the College of Southern Nevada, will be presenting. Um, first, I just want to apologize because I'm used to lecturing, but I know time is an issue, and I want to make sure that the information I provided was under 10 minutes. So I'm presenting it as a lecture, and I apologize for that because buckle up, this is going to be some high octane information coming at you. Um, so, hello, my name is Sara Quintana. I am the West Charleston Campus Early College Manager at the College of Southern Nevada. Today, I will be presenting the Back on Track program, which is a specialized credit retrieval program delivered through a restorative justice model. Any education program should always be responsive to an identified community need. In this case, the issue is specific to members of the community who have not attained a high school diploma. In Southern Nevada alone, there are over 210,000 adults without a high school diploma or equivalent. Compounding this problem is that annually, around 20% of public high school seniors do not graduate with their peers. The largest operating public credit retrieval service also most recently reported a completion rate of 0%. The silver lining, however, is that a large data set affords the opportunity to identify trends and subpopulations. One identified group is teen parents. Additionally, the data table on the right visualizes representation within the credit deficient population. The blue columns indicate the overall population, while the gray columns represent the 13.6% of adults aged 25 and over without a high school diploma. Native Americans and Native Hawaiians slash Pacific Islanders are overrepresented among this population. In summary, our education system is not meeting the needs of our indigenous population. The first thing to realize about the population in question is that time is a limited resource. Students age out of secondary services, the Nevada Promise program, and it's difficult to save for retirement without a high school diploma. As such, dual enrollment is an existing structure that embodies an equity-based approach to maximize time to stop the cycle of generational poverty. We must blackfoot before we can bloom. So most educators have heard the phrase, we must Maslow before we can bloom. However, Maslow's hierarchy of needs focuses on the individual. And in his research, Maslow found that only five to 10% of the general population was able to achieve it. Maslow then lived with the Blackfoot people and he was shocked to realize that around 90 to 100% of their population achieved self-actualization. Furthermore, within that indigenous model, self-actualization -actual led to community actualization, which then promoted cultural perpetuity. The key difference between the two models is that Maslow placed the responsibility of getting needs met on the individual, while the Blackfoot people saw it as a community responsibility. The Back on Track program embodies this same indigenous philosophy and approach. To that end, during a Navajo peacekeeping workshop, which is a very famous restorative justice model, the facilitator stated that these types of models only work when implemented in a holistic and systemic manner. And that makes sense, right? If the community approach is not systemic, not all needs will be met and self-actualization will not be possible. Oops, I advanced it. I didn't need to do that. Sorry. In terms of a credit retrieval model, this means that obtaining a high school diploma is insufficient. Students require a viable pathway to economic independence that includes opportunities for a career advancement and continuing education options. To maximize impact, the College of Southern Nevada is partnering with secondary sites that specialize in alternative education and credit retrieval models. This allows all partners to play to their strengths and maximize our effectiveness. Of our two currently active operators, both sites report success rates of over 80% and offer extensive wraparound services. 
The Beacon Academy of Nevada is a Southern Nevada public charter school with multiple campuses serving students aged 16 to 21. They have a measurable teen parent population and offer flexible scheduling and delivery options. The Battleborn Youth Challenge Academy is actually our oldest operator and we initially partnered with them in 2021. They are a rural alternative education public school operating in the Elko County School District and they also have a partnership with the Clark County School District. BBYCA utilizes a structured residential program with 24-7 support and offers a year-long mentor match after completing the program. Thrive Point Academy of Nevada is our newest partner and they are projected to launch in the fall of 2024. While we still need to determine the specifics for this site, they will be a Southern Nevada operator with a model similar to Beacon Academy. With our secondary partners building close relationships and meeting the daily needs of our population, CSN is then permitted to focus on workforce training. It's well established that one of the most effective education practices is to differentiate to meet the needs of your students, and this program is no different. With that in mind, we have several different program modalities designed for our various subpopulations. Traditional dual enrollment delivery is ideal for young students close to their high school diploma and offers them an opportunity to fulfill requirements toward a credited career and technical education program. In theory, the dual enrollment population will then be able to align to the Nevada, Nevada Promise Scholarship requirements, allowing for a funded continuing education option. In the case of students that are very behind or older, the adult-based education route makes more sense rather than trying to recoup credits course by course. Thankfully, CSN's Division of Workforce and Economic Development offers programming in which students can complete both their high school equivalent and obtain industry training. Finally, for older, high-performing students, registered apprenticeship programming is a pathway we aspire to offer. One identified CTE pathway specific to the teen parent population is the early childhood education route. The fact is Nevada is one of only three states that currently does not offer a statewide teen parent, teen parent program. Additionally, ECE training supports teen parents personally by developing their parenting skills and once certified allows them to obtain a job that offers a pension, benefits, and a work schedule that, that generally aligns with their child's school year. Additionally, ECE training can also be delivered in both a dual enrollment and adult-based adult education format. Finally, with the establishment of an on-site ECE lab to serve as a practicum location, students can obtain free childcare while completing their education. A tentative timeline of next steps for phased implementation is listed. So for the 23-24 school year, um, this includes a dual soft enrollment launch of the two established operators, the Battleborn Youth Challenge Academy and the Beacon Academy of Nevada. We also hope to work with the state to explore secondary credit options for DWED programming, and this will actually help all DWED students because if su successful, it will provide a framework of appropriate placement, with, which then are credit-based programming to continue their education. So just to clarify, DWED is non-credit-based, if we can work out the secondary alignment, it allows a framework to, for them to then continue through the credit-based programming. So it marries the two sides of the house for us. We plan to partner place, oh wait, I'm sorry. We plan to partner with the Nevada Foster Youth Program as a part, oh, I'm, excuse me, I'm sorry. We plan to partner with the Nevada Foster Youth Program as participation in a foster youth program is the highest indicator for high school dropouts. We'd also like to establish an internal referral system among our secondary partners to ensure students' needs are being met to the best of our collective ability. So for example, as I mentioned, Battleborn Youth Challenge Academy utilizes a rural residential program. Some students down here in Las Vegas, that's exactly what they need because they're too distracted by everything that is Vegas here. Whereas some students that are, you know, they have work requirements, they have to support their household, they need the flexibility that is offered by Beacon Academy. And so it's really playing to those strengths and going back to the theme that we need to differentiate as much as possible to meet the needs of these students. Finally, we aspire to solidify a funding plan. To that end, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. I'm hopeful that entering this proposal into the record will assist in petitioning the state for support. For the 24-25 school year, this includes the launch of our third operator, the Thrive Point Academy of Nevada. Ideally, the registered apprenticeship options will also be solidified as they take a few years to develop. 
We also hope to initiate parallel ARL programming for secondary staff members to certify them. We will need to partner with UNLV to achieve this. However, Beacon Academy is excited to pilot the model as all their TAs have bachelor's degrees and the site can ideally serve as another practicum location. Um, so this is kind of back to that grow your own concept. Obviously, this program is highly specialized and you need highly specialized staff for that. So ideally, if you can use the secondary site as a practicum location, Students that are raised in that model are already exposed to the philosophy and can better embody the restorative justice that is needed for it to be successful. We also plan to launch semi-annual recruitment fairs. Our secondary partners have identified student referrals as an obstacle, so the proposed solution is to host two alternative education fairs. One around winter break, because that's usually when a student that's supposed to graduate that following semester realizes they're not going to make it. And the other is, and this is kind of sad, is when all the graduations are done in the summer and if they didn't graduate with their peers, they're wondering, what do I do next and what are my options? Um, and we just want to raise general awareness of alternative education options that are available across the city. For the 25-26 school year, we will feature the launch of an on-site early college education lab at Beacon Academy. The date is in alignment with the site's own plans to move from a leased location to a permanent building. By incorporating the ECE lab facility requirements with that move, we can minimize costs and improve efficiency. The second semester is when the first round of formal program evaluation will begin. Programming gaps and other issues will be identified and solutions will be proposed for the implementation in the 26-27 school year. I wanna pause right there real quick because I recently received notice from ThrivePoint that they are also interested in establishing an early childhood education lab and they plan to launch next year and they're still determining their facility requirements. So it's something that we can possibly incorporate into that model as well. Finally, for the 26-27 school year, um, this will signify the finalization of the model. It will also initiate the state of a biannual data-driven pro program review and report in alignment with the legislative schedule. Additionally, this review will, will continue in an iterative manner to ensure program relevance moving forward. In my experience, around four years or so is when you really start to know changes in the student population. And so it's really important that you have this reiterative process that you're continually reviewing the program to ensure it's always relevant to the student population you're trying to serve. With all these elements in place, this model will have the potential of a statewide implementation. Um, slides eight and nine, I just have my references up there for all the facts that I did provide during the presentation because you should never make a claim without being able to substantiate it. And then finally, uh, for the last slide, I'd like to thank Dr. Rochelle Hooks. She is CSN's education chair. Dr. Hooks has decades of experience and is an early childhood education subject matter expert. Her knowledge is integral to the, to the success of this program. I'm very grateful to have a team member with a foundational understanding of restorative justice practices. To that end, I'd also like to thank Dr. Sonia Pearson, West Charleston Campus Vice President. Dr. Pearson also understands restorative justice practices and has years of experience delivering this type of programming. She has been a consistent and staunch supporter of this initiative and is the embodiment of a servant leader who understands and responds to community need. So thank you again for allowing me to present today. I'd like to open the floor to any questions and also Dr. Hooks is here if you'd like to ask her questions about the early childhood education components. Thank you, that was a lot of information. Yes, it thank is. you, thank very, you. Very, very dense information. <laughs> um, okay, are there any questions from the committee or any other members present? I can't, oh, uh, Regent Cruz Crawford. Thank you, Chair. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record. Thank you, Quint um, Dr. Quintana. I have a question about, uh, first of all, I've uh, had the pleasure of working with Battleborn Youth Academy and the National Guard, and it is phenomenal. And um, I wanted to ask about um, how are we getting this information out to the public that might need uh, this resource? I've uh, been talking to a lot of people that are like, my kid is credit deficient. They're not going to be able to graduate high school, uh, college and career issues like that. How are we communicating uh, the Beacon Academy and uh, Battleborn Youth Academy um, within that high school space so that they can attend CSN? 
Um, so the plan moving forward, as I mentioned before, we're trying to play to each other's strengths. And one of the strengths that CSN has is we're a large institution. We're the fifth largest community college in the nation. And we have a dedicated marketing department. So the vision is in the similar way that you'll have a magnet fair that is, you know, like publicly advertised. And then you will standardize when it's held. So ideally semi-annually in this case. But we need to work up to where we can actually quantify exactly what those services will be. Um, and we also want to invite other community partners to that event. So one of the other gaps that I had mentioned, I, I did talk about how the secondary partners will be primarily providing the wraparound services. But both partners have indicated that there's a gap for DACA services and we can provide those. And so we would, in, for example, invite that department to that event. So it's not just about the alternative education options. They start to learn more about the other community options as well. But ideally, that would work through our marketing department and also through um, other opportunities for publicity. So for example, I know that we have some staff members that participate in a weekly radio show, so they can advertise it there too. But essentially, that, that's, that's the plan anyways, utilize that sort of marketing. Okay, and I'm sure this has already been discussed. I don't know if a student that's credit deficient is going to be listening to the KMPR radio, but um, what about junior studies? I know a lot of our kids have junior studies in 11th grade and counselor, school counselor, high school school counselor outreach. I think those would be uh, valuable resources. I'm sure it's already been thought of, um, but I would like to to put that out there. Yeah, so specifically the Battleborn Youth Challenge Academy, I do know that they specifically request um, students be identified that are probably not on track to graduate. Where we're kind of looking is at the start of their senior year, if they're a year behind, that's a good starting point because it's not likely that they're going to be graduating with their peers at that point. Um, it's just working those muscles to get the communication uh, happening. Thank you. Regent Goodman. Uh, Regent Cruz Crawford just addressed what I was going to say, but I do think that the largest gap is between the student and, you know, and, and just knowing that, like it, that counselor, if that counselor can just say, hey, I, I've, I've experienced this in some of the work that I do, and, and I see that there's a gap there. The kids just don't know. They just think it's done, and there's nothing that they can do. And um, I, just that communication right there, that awareness on the counselor level, I think would probably be great. So um, anything we can do to help facilitate that, I think it's it, this is a great program. I think a lot of it, too, is that when you have these types of new initiatives, if you think about it in terms of a business venture, then you need to provide some sort of proof of concept that it can be successful, that these students are capable of achieving these things. And once you could really quantify that and show them the outcomes, then the program solves itself. And so I think like in these initial stages, there's going to be a lot of skeptical people. And I understand and I acknowledge that. And so it's just pr doing the work and proving what is possible and then showing them, you know, this is where we're going. This is, it's not the end of the road. And F doesn't mean that you failed. It just means you haven't mastered the material yet. Great question. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, question for Mina or statement? Um, hold, hold, hold on, I can't see who that is, but I do see a hand from um, Regent um, Carvalho. Oh, thank you, Chair Perkins. Um, I had a, a question for Ms. Quintana. Um, you, you mentioned dual enrollment in your um, presentation, and, and maybe you said this and I missed it, so I apologize if that's the case, but um, is CSN offering dual enrollment to students at um, Beacon Academy or Battleborn, or is there a um, an anticipation of offering that at some point? Yes, they're in, we're initiating it this fall semester. So that's the soft launch component, and it's just the dual enrollment component because that's already been established. The other stuff is going to require some development to get there, but yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that was um, Regent Arascata that had a question. It is. Thank you, Chair Perkins. 
Thank you. Great, great presentation. Regent Carvalho had a spot on question just a second ago, but uh, this was a great report and I want to express our appreciation. But the presented materials are, are academic programs and they seem to fall under the scope of ARSA. And so perhaps in the future, if we could have a, a follow-up uh, with the ARSA committee, I think it would be greatly beneficial for all. So thank you. Sure. Good point. Um, I considered it under access. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any other questions from the committee members or any members present? Seeing none, two questions actually. How can we assist you? And what are the major obstacles that you have found so far? Um, so I would say funding was one of them. Uh, we had identified a few grants to support this program, but were informed we couldn't apply for them. And so that's part of the reason why I'm hopeful that we can petition the state for support. Um, the funding doesn't include any sort of capital improvements, and we worked with our secondary partners to identify what the needs are. So it, primarily it would just be student fees, books, and then beyond that, any sort of capacity building would happen at the secondary site. And that makes sense because we already have the infrastructure for CSN to accommodate these students. It's that one-to-one -one daily interaction where they're developing the relationship at the secondary site. Plus, you're going to need specialized workers, such as social workers. Um, that's the only kind of capacity building that was considered. But it's really just the student fees and the books these students are already so so marginalized that it would be irresponsible of me to expect them to pay for this on top of you know any other concerns that they already have. That's a that's a mighty obstacle. We're, yes. We'll work on that. And we'll then, think about that. Sorry, um, the other one would just be the DWED alignment because right now there is no alignment between DWED and secondary credit. I did see that last legislative session there was a bill passed. It's AB two five six, I believe that opens up the door to earning secondary credit to work-based educational programs, which I believe it's a little bit different, but it's kind of in line. And so I'm curious if we can massage that out a little bit to establish the secondary credit for DUED programming. But as I mentioned, that's a larger problem that the college has in general because DUED's non-credit based. And so it's really just large, it would impact a larger population than just the credit deficient population because like I said, it would allow a framework for a continuing adult to return back to CSN and then have appropriate placement within the credit side of the house to continue their own education and afford them an opportunity for career advancement as well. Thank you for that. Um, I agree 100%. Um, that's part of the lifelong learning type of thing that we, we here all believe in. So. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, yeah, I would look forward to an update, maybe six, eight months. Okay. See how it's going. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now we're going to go back to item number five. I guess that's me, huh? I'm leading a discussion on the recruitment and hiring of professional positions at um, INCHI. Originally, this was supposed to, if, okay, we can't really change the um, culture of an organization unless we change how we recruit those people that participate in the culture of the, of the organization. Um, with that, I have questions for, for the, um, is uh, Dr. Payson still in the audience somewhere? She is. Um, when you, you mentioned some things about what would be the major concerns uh, about the uh, anonymous hiring? Because if we just blank out any identifiable remarks, would you, that would, I know um, you and I has, has been um, making headway in that, but if you, because sometimes you look at an application and just because somebody's named Tamika, you don't, you know, that implicit bias kicks in, even though we don't realize it and we're not doing it on purpose. So um, what would be your concerns about basically taking out the name, which college they graduated from? Because if um, uh, more than likely if somebody come, come, came from Howard University, there was an assumption there that they would 
you know, there's an automatic assumption there. And I guess I'll stop there and let you answer the, those questions. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, and again, I think as a first step, if, if there's nothing that's happening in a hiring process, that thinking about anonymizing information may be helpful in addressing implicit bias. Like I said, at least where we're at with UNR right now, um, kind of reviewing the studies about uh, corporations who have anonymized uh, applications to show that there's bias, that's part of our implicit bias training. So doing that practice isn't necessarily as helpful as having the mindset that we're always aware of what's going on with anonymous review or implicit bias. Um, obviously, there's some differences with when we're talking about academic faculty hiring, so people who were hiring for their teaching and their research, of which it's sort of impractical to try to remove their name or remove where they went to get their PhD or their other credentials, because that's information that's important in terms of our teaching and research especially in research positions, we're looking at somebody's published academic record. And so you can't evaluate or look at their published research without finding their article. And so we'll find their names <laughs> as part of that. And sometimes it's helpful to know where somebody went to different programs as different institutions across the United States have specific specific skills um, or areas of specialization with what they research in particular. So again, some of that information about where they went to school may be important in evaluating the totality of the candidate, but we should never, and this would be the implicit bias part, we should never hire somebody just because they went to a Harvard or just because they went to Howard. We're looking at that total package. In terms of our professional uh, faculty or administrative faculty positions, so again, those cover everybody working in libraries, working in our labs, working in Marcom, working uh, in financial services all across those areas. Again, I think that we don't have to take that step of trying to anonymize their record if we are already building in other practices as we've done at UNR as part, where we're all aware of our implicit bias, where we have things like utilizing rubrics of which we're objectively scoring each candidate on the same criteria to ensure that we're not letting in those things like where somebody went to school or because we're best friends with them um, to impede our process. When we're building in and requiring um, other steps of that process, having somebody from outside the department on our search committees who would be there to be like, oh, it sounds like to me that you all are favoring this school over another, for example. Um, so again, I don't think that necessarily doing That's anonymized right. review is right. a bad I'm practice. Well, I'm just saying just that. Last, you know, open the whole thing. <laughs> I'm just saying that we want to ensure that we're not um, requiring all of our institutions to use that specific practice, especially when we have our different schools, our departments that are already utilizing practices that get at that very issue of implicit bias, but that we've developed these practices and processes within our faculty uh, committees all together. I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, it does, actually. Um, but I was wondering, since you started this practice, do you have um, metrics? Do you have any proof that um, this method is working, or does it need to be adapted, or um, et cetera? Yeah, so that's one thing that I know that our diversity committee has started to look at um, last year. We do have within the Workday system a DEI dashboard and that we can get some information, but again, just sort of with, with other work that we've done, we've not done a report. So I can say anecdotally in looking at, um, and we just pulled some numbers on academic faculty positions, not administrative faculty which we might see some differences, but just, you know, as kind of a, what what does this data have? What data can we pull from the Workday system? Um, we did see just, again, very beginning process, and we'll continue this work over this next year, that if we're comparing the numbers, say, of African-American female academic faculty that have left the institution, I think we went back to 2018, versus how many African-American female faculty have we hired in that same time period, we actually have more uh, hiring in that demographic category than a faculty that have left. So 
I, I can't make any causal statements about whether or not our practices are working, um, but we can see some demographic shifts. But I also know that just from serving on a variety of committees in a variety of units on campus over the past couple of years, that instead of there being just one person who's sort of tasked with double checking that we're doing right by diversity, that it is becoming more of a norm. Everybody is aware of, and it's not just one person in the room that says, hey, we need to do a diversity question when we're doing these Zoom interviews. Everybody is aware of it and bringing it, that into the process. And for committees that utilize those rubrics, again, the conversations about candidates are less about oh, they work at this place and that place is good, let's hire them, and more on this person checks the boxes of these criteria that we're looking at. This person does demonstrate that they understand commitments to DEI with our diversity statements. Um, and so the conversation is different in terms of that because we have all of these steps of the process and a pretty robust training with implicit bias as well as how we handle searches. Thank you. Thank you for that information. I appreciate that. That will give us some guidance in the future. Um, from UNLV. <laughs> for the record, Bill Robinson, UNLV Faculty Senate. Can I just say ditto? <laughs> I, I really liked exactly what she said. We are also, again, we had administrations in the past who did not want to give us that data, did not want to track it, because I think they were afraid of what it would show. And we are now in that process where we have access to the data, we're working on the data. We have talented people on our campus who have experience elsewhere who are helping us do all this. Um, before too long, I think both UNR and UNLV will have good data that we can give you. And again, my off my thumb, I think we're having more problems with retention right now than we are on the hiring side because we're actually, you know, there are mechanisms on campus, training and other mechanisms on campus to try to get folks to 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 think about what they're doing. And it's the I, I still think we're having more trouble with the retention side. But it doesn't mean that the hiring's perfect across campus and there are entities on campus who haven't hired a woman since long before I had hair. <laughs> and and we still have work to do. So how would you suggest we move forward? Um, well, I'm, when, oh, I'm sorry. I need no, to clarify that no. we're talking about item number five or six. We're talking about item number six, which I skipped. I'm sorry. I did that. Um, apologies. Um, we're talking about item number six, um, equity in hiring and retention, blind hiring implementation. Um, so, so, so I like, I like making this available as an option in hiring. That, and there are some areas in campus where it, it obviously applies and would be a, a fine thing. But again, as, as, as she said, if we, if we're hiring a faculty member and we, we get the name of their publication, it doesn't matter how blind it is. We, we already, we know everything about them. This is true. Agreed. However, when, um, if you're willing to do the research, you can find out somebody just by how tall they are and the color of their eyes. Well, you know, if you're willing to do the research and dig, but um, I guess on that, what I was thinking is on that initial, um, when you first get all the applications in, that initial uh, evaluation, I know we have all had training on implicit bias, but that's why it's implicit, because we don't realize we're doing it. And so no matter how much implicit bias training, we could do it every six months or every three months, and there would still be some remnants of implicit, uh, implicit bias uh, expressed during the... I, and I agree. And I don't think anyone can complain if that first cut of us going through and eliminating people, though sometimes, as, as we were talking about earlier, sometimes people slip something into the job description that by its nature, right, you have, have to have done this and you know that, you know, it's people who look like me who have done that mostly. Mm. Or there, there's, so it's the whole process has to be clean from end to end. It can't just be one part. Agreed. You know what I'm saying? And, and you have a much more tough job than I do because I just get to sit here and answer questions. You actually have to come up with something to do. No, staff does, ha -ha. No. <laughs> Well, staff, and, and you have excellent staff to, to, to help you with that. But you know, the, the, the whole thing has to be clean and that has to be a group effort from the faculty side, from the 
administrative side from the DEI side on campus where we're all, we're, we all have a goal of working together and, you know, and that means too that our senior administration sometimes has to step in and go, hey, we're closing this, shirt, this, this search down. We've had searches that we have asked to be, and, they have, and it hasn't happened. We haven't tried that with the new current administration. But we, had, you know, we have problem areas on campus, and somehow the administration has to be willing to make some tough choices sometimes. And I don't know how the board even can legislate that part of it. So it's, it's, it's such, such a big and complex Issue. There are all kinds of jobs on campus that this would be a perfect way, perfect way to hire people. It's it's just a question of which of the searches does it really work for, and which other searches could it work for part of the part of the process, but somehow in there, right? So let me throw this out there. Right now, it's just speculation. Like we're saying, it won't work for this, or it won't work for that, or it won't work for this. But until we actually run it and go through the motions of it, how will we ever know? So, because right now we're all just guessing. I, I think, and I'm, I hope she's gonna say ditto to me here in a second. <laughs> but I, I think what we're asking is we don't put ourselves in a position where if something, if we figure out it's not working, that it takes a long time and messes up a whole bunch of things to go back and undo it. There's. You know, there's the old little kid puts their hand, head through the wrought iron and it's really easy to get your head in, but sometimes it's really hard to get your head back. Welcome to academia. Out again. And so the, the more you encourage and the less you constrain, it probably makes us more comfortable. I don't want to speak for her. She's at the, at the modem again. <laughs> Amy Payson for the record again. Um, and, and I think on the agenda that there was a group at UNLV that had done a pilot study. And so I certainly would be interested um, in hearing those results. I will say that in initial discussions with the Faculty Diversity Committee at UNR specifically, in looking at our hiring practices and processes, and especially when it comes to those administrative faculty positions, because we're competing against private industry with those administrative faculty positions. So one thing that we're really cautious of um, is trying to implement too many steps and barriers because that means we're, we're not going to hire anybody, right? It's much quicker for somebody to apply and get a job in marketing communications in Renown, but if we have lots of extra steps in our processes and our search is delayed, we're going to lose out on that really good, talented person at UNR. So that's where, again, sort of the hesitation about a one-size-fits-all, we really need to think about our processes. Um, with our hiring practices, we go through the workday system. So again, we also have to weigh the, the cost benefits. Can we get the achievement that we want, but also try to make our processes efficient? So doing a, an anonymized review of application materials, that means that our HR teams are going to have to work overtime with all the applications that come through to download application materials, then black out any identifying information, which could be difficult depending on the kind of, of job that is. And again, if we get that same outcome because we've got well-trained folks, we have the rubric process, we have some other checks and balances all along the way, then just removing some names at that beginning process is a lot of extra work for not actually helping us overall. So again, uh, I think what we're doing in our practices are achieving that goal and that this particular practice uh, maybe not what, what we're looking to do. But again, I think my colleague down south there, um, I think, you know, units who may want to use this practice themselves totally can, can do that. Having a requirement across the system may not be the direction that we want to go. And that's why we're having this conversation so that we can um, come up with a plan moving forward. Um, all I can say is what we're doing now isn't working because we're, we haven't been able to retain um, minority. Um, is that Regent Tarkanian? We haven't been able to retain um, uh, minority and minority and otherwise marginalized communities in these positions. So whatever we're doing up to now hasn't been working. Um, I 
just by, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So we need a, um, I would strongly, I think we have enough information now to like kind of move forward with the plan or at least a demi plan to um, just start the big conversation. Um, I'll go to CI, uh, officer in charge, Patty Charlton, and then to uh, Dr. Saval. So thank you for correcting. I'm not a CIO. That just for uh, the oh, record. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That would oh, be quite dangerous. So no. So for the record, Patty Charlton, um, officer in charge uh, for the system of higher education. So first, I wanted to put on the record that um, in regards to the agenda, just a correction. Um, I had been in this role for six days and uh, was unaware. I had understood that there was a pilot program that was um, approved by this body and then move forward um, in conversation with uh, your staff member, Director Williams, as well as UNLV, uh, and with the comments that um, UNR had shared is that there may be some challenges with uh, Workday. And so in order to go through that process, however, those can be deployed and overcome, um, just I think as the Faculty Senate had said, it would be across the board. And so um, would just, uh, again, I'm anxious to hear the, the conversation and, and recognize that this is an action item. And so as the chancellor's office and staff is, uh, is uh, asked to bring back um, additional information and plans, we welcome that opportunity. Um, I know that there are other faculty senate um, chairs and I know, uh, I'm not sure if there's any track members here today, um, but to, to move forward on what that might look like for um, those opportunities to address uh, the agenda item, as well as the concerns that have been shared. Um, there may be, and it sounds like some institutions may have some practices in place that might be helpful um, for us to also um, hear about, engage, and bring that back to this body and to this committee as a whole to, to have that conversation, see what is being done, because I know blind hiring is one, um, and I, I also welcome to hear uh, the opportunity from uh, UNLV and their diversity officers of all uh, on that regard, but uh, we are welcome and stand ready. Um, I know Dr. William, or Mr. Williams, our staff member, is ready to go, and we would like to, to have this conversation forwarded and engage in that shared governance process to see what will work and ensure that we have the richest academic pools and administrative pools of individuals. Um, I agree with Mr. Robinson also, and I think everyone in the system, including the board, knows that retention is one of our greatest challenges, but we also have to bring people in so that we can retain them. So let's bring them in and let's have the richest um, faculty that we can and staff uh, to support these amazing students that we have. So thank you. Thank you for those comments. All right, for the record, Saval Yildirim, uh, Vice President for Diversity Initiatives and Chief Diversity Officer and Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies in Law. Um, I just wanted to clarify that we have not run any pilot programs uh, because again, there have been issues with Workday. But I do want to, as I have expressed in the past, I think we have to be very careful with how we discuss searches for academic faculty and for non-academic faculty. And that's the reason why I also stated my academic title, because I very much appreciate that academic searches are very, very different in nature, and they have to include shared governance principles. Uh, meaning we have to have a faculty primacy in the way the searches are done. So we have to be working with our faculty senates as well as our faculty in the departments. I also wanted to add that like our colleagues at UNR, we will actually be implementing best practices that include diversity checks, um, trainings on bias, um, as well as um, search advocates sitting on committees, which we have had now for two years. And I have had experience with all of these with very, very positive outcomes in a Cal State that is just a few hours away, a Cal State San Bernardino. So I'm happy at some later point to discuss what those positive outcomes are. But um, while blind hiring may work really well for um, the administrative faculty side and our other staff positions, as well as our executive positions, there may be serious issues with the academic side. So I just wanted to add that and clarify that we have not yet 
run the pilot, and we were going to do that with one of our administrative faculty searches, not an academic faculty search. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you for that clarification. Unless there are questions for me. Uh, any questions from committee members present uh, here or non-committee members that are present? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So, I'm sorry. I lost my pace. Okay. So, thank you for all the comments. And I think we have enough information now to... Um, to move forward with um, coming back at the next meeting with um, a well-developed plan. It's three months away, so we have 90 days to get this together. Um, Regent Goodman. What do you mean by a well-developed plan? Like what? what is, should we just table this item since we don't have well, a, um, since we don't you know, have a pilot to refer to wouldn't, would that be the best thing to do? I don't, I don't think we have enough information at all, actually, to um, put anything together just yet. So um, it'll have to table well, it. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Can I ask um, Council, uh, Deputy Council Parker just to weigh in? Um, I think if the request is specifically around blind hiring, I think, um, as we've heard, we may not quite be ready with the system. However, if we're looking at a, a broader plan from the chancellor, Chancellor's Office or their designee or staff um, to bring back something to the next meeting, I think that would be ex uh, appropriate. But I'd ask Carrie Parker, please. Deputy General Counsel Carrie Parker, for the record, I think that agenda item six is related to the blind hiring, and it sounds like the discussion is about approaching professional positions, the hiring of professional positions through a idea lens. So it seems like if, if it were uh, within the chair's discretion, if she would like to combine the item with number five, um, it sounds to me the discussion is about what can we do to help with the inclusion, diversity issues and related to hiring, that that might fall within agenda item five. I don't think what Chair Perkins wants to do is not allowed by the agenda. It just might work better with five. Um, but I would defer to Chair Perkins and what her uh, vision is of the action. Okay. Well, we were discussing, well, we were actually on um, item number six, which since we don't have a pilot, I don't, um, there's no action to take. I mean, So if I can, um, okay, so let me clarify. To combine items five and six, since we've had the discussion, we can just make all the comments apply to both of them. Uh, Deputy General Counsel Carrie Parker, for the record, that's correct. Under the open meeting law, agenda items may be combined. Perfect. Then let's do that um, because- Chair they, Perkins? Uh, sure, that's uh, Regent Arascata. Yes, thank you very much. I apologize for the interruption. But it seems that the, some of the logical steps to implementing this program or any other program throughout the entire INCHI system would be something that is somewhat regimented. If we don't have a, high, a blind hiring program that has been conducted, we don't have the results. When is the project state going to happen? What will the pro what will the pilot program consist of? How how is the 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 program itself? going to be implemented? What are some of the steps that are going to be taken? This, in the, this is in the most infantile process, or steps of the entire process, because the, the entire board still needs to go through this, still needs to receive the results. Um, we need, still we need results of the human differences that are not limited to race, ethnicity, gender, identity, uh, uh, sexual orientation, so, uh, social class, physical, physical disability, any sort of uh, cognitive disability, religious, ethnical, um, ethical. I mean, there's so many different steps that still need to be conducted before just throwing this in. So I feel that it's imperative, a, at least a start date for the pilot program needs to be, I don't, I don't at least thrown out there. We haven't uh, even gotten to that all point the yet. Uh, sorry. All the campuses need to be alerted. There's, there's just a lot that needs to be done prior to 
to moving on. I'd like to just start from the onset. Thank you. Those are great suggestions. However, um, we, we haven't done a pilot, therefore we have nothing to put forward. And we've been discussing this for over a year now with, with the DEI agents and the IDEA committee who are our subject matter experts. Um, yes, it is in the beginning stages, but infantile, not yet. Um, but it is in the beginning stages. However, we have to start somewhere. So um, with all these conversations and all this input, I think it's very important that we start somewhere, um, whether it's blanking out the names through Workday or whether it's um, having a workshop, but we have to start somewhere. We just can't keep kicking the can down the road. With that, ne things will never change um, or never be uh, equitable. Um, Regent Goodman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my recommendation would be to move to table this item to the next meeting so that that blind uh, hiring um, pilot that we have out there can actually be done, and then we can move forward and make a, a decision based on, on that report once we get it. I just, I feel we're premature right now with this item since we don't have, like you said, any of this information. I am not saying we should kick the can down the road, but I do think we need to table this item to the next committee meeting, and perhaps we'll be more ready at that time. Um, I, I would take some uh, input from our officer in charge. So for the record, Patty Charlson, officer in charge of the system. Um, at this time, again, uh, we could perhaps bring back um, some of the strategies and approaches regarding blind hiring. We do know that to do this in Workday would be an across-the-board change, and I would uh, ask Director Williams to confirm. I know he's had conversations with System Computing Services. Um, I would also ask, uh, again, through our shared governance lens to, you've heard from faculty, we would want to also engage our human resources, which was part of the process and included in the agenda item, the Human Resources Advisory Committee, Faculty Senate and our institutions um, prior to an implementation within Workday. That's just my, my May suggestion. I clarify something? So to clarify, in order to run the pilot program, you actually have to do this um, across this. Okay. So to do a pilot program so that this isn't just an isolated, isolated pilot program. Okay, so that's a problem. For the record, Patty okay. Charlton, um, officer in charge, I would ask um, Director Williams to confirm, and I also believe um, that other members, perhaps even of the IDEA Council, may have uh, participated in conversations. But uh, Tillery, please. For the record, Tillery Williams, Director of Community Engagement, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, so at the last IDEA committee meeting, uh, it was stated on the record that we would move forward with a pilot. And uh, at that time, uh, we had been talking to UNLV and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Yildrum um, for about three or four months. And I think that um, former acting chancellor Urquiaga stated on the record that we just did not have the capital to do it inside the NC office. So UNLV was gracious enough to step in and um, agree to do a, a, a pilot program. Um, but as we were having those conversations, we did run across some of the limitations from the workday standpoint. In order to run the pilot, then we have to work with SCS to determine and this committee um, what we will be blocking out if we were to implement such a uh, process. And so I think that was the uh, nexus for wanting to develop a plan because if we could talk to all of the um, stakeholders, then we could get that feedback and then move forward with implementing it at a wider scale. So I think that these this conversation is two to threefold. Um, we, we, we do the pilot, but as that's going on, um, they're going to have to need some direction and input from the regents um, through whatever process we develop in that plan, which goes out and talks to the faculty senate, which talks to HRAC, um, which talks to whoever we need to talk to to be able to put us in a, in a, in a situation to develop a process that considers all of the things that have been stated on the record. Um, and one of the most critical things is determining what information to block out. At that point, then we could proceed with whatever 
the, the desire of this committee and the board is, if that makes sense. Did that, did that answer your question? Awesome. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to throw in there that we depend on the uh, IDEA Council to go back to their individual campuses and bring us that information forward because they are the subject matter experts on DEI. So just want to throw that in there. Um, Chair, Chair Perkins? I see. There, there was uh, a motion. Uh, Regent Scott, go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. There was a motion on the table set forth by Regent Goodman to, if you could re restate that or pull the... Uh, no motion, just a question, sir. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Regent Perkins, I think you have a question um, remote. Uh, Regent, Regent Carvalho. Carvalho. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Perkins. I, I appreciate your, your desire to... Um, want to improve our hiring processes. I think it's I, I think it's something that's that's needed and um and and commendable that you want to take this on. Obviously this is a um an interesting discussion we've had. Um I do think it's important to have uh some data driven analysis of this. I was looking at um our institutional um research dashboard and we do have some disaggregated data um, both NC wide and within our institutions. And I, I do see that, um, in, in terms of employee headcount by ethnicity and race, and in terms of, um, employee headcount by gender, there have been improvements that have been made in the past 10 years. Probably not to the extent that we would like to see, especially given, um, the, the changing demographics of our students. And I think that it's really important to compare um, some of those numbers between our student population and our employee population so that they they more mirror one another. Um, so I, I would encourage the, the committee to consider um, some of that uh, information in, in perhaps a pilot or or in terms of metrics for for what you would like to see in a pilot. Um, and and given also the conversation that we've had today regarding retention, I think it would also be interesting if the committee um, could learn some information regarding exited employees in, in terms of exit interviews or why why employees are leaving. I, I know that you mentioned earlier that there that, that um, there's been con some concern with that. And I don't know if that information is um, easily collected or available to the committee, but I think that that would also be interesting um, information for the committee to have. Um, and, and last, I, I do hear that our institutions, um, from those that we've heard from, uh, seem to also feel strongly that um, and across the board in, you know, system wide approach may not be the best um, course with this. And, and I'd also like to be sure that um, staff who are, are considering it a policy or a pilot also consider that as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I believe that the data that you're speaking of on the um, the diversity within the institutions, I think that inc includes classified. It's not separated by um, administrative faculty, faculty, and classified. And so it's kind of giving um, an illusion that we are very diverse when in fact the, um, if you s separate those three entities, like the administrative faculty versus the um, teaching faculty versus classified, it paints a little bit of different picture. I appreciate that 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 difference, and and I think it would be important for the committee to to see those numbers disaggregated even further. Then that could be a new business item. Thank you, Regent Carvalho. Regent Goodman. 
Um, so upon hearing all of this and receiving all the information, I feel that it would be irresponsible if we tried to even do any kind of blind hiring pilot across uh, the, the, the system. I think we need to maybe look at some other options. The fact that we are doing implicit bias training, the fact that some of the work that we're doing, it sounds like we're really working to address some of the issues that are happening in our hiring process. and. Um, I think it, uh, I completely agree with both of the faculty senate chairs that um, to, to hire someone uh, in an academic position without being able to know what kind of research they've done, where they've been published, where they went to school, all of these things are very important. And um, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. You know, why why do individuals work so hard if, if they're not even going to be considered for that kind of, of very difficult, hard work? So for me, um, I just, I'm stating my opinion and I will leave this up to our chair to determine what we need to do next. But I, I feel that um, it sounds like we're doing a lot of things that are working to make sure our hiring process is better and it is not, um, it is, it is not um, uh, ignoring the uh, diversity. It is not ignoring um, individuals that, that bring a, a, a beautiful diverse picture to our campuses. So for me, I feel like what we're doing right now might be good enough. I think it's too much of a risk to try to put a blind hiring process across all of our um, all of our institutions at this point. I think we need to figure out a better way to to figure to figure this out. But right now, I, I think this is at an impasse, and um, I, I don't know what the action is for this item. I'd like to leave that to you, Chair. But I just wanted to express my opinion. Um, thank you. The, I think I said it earlier. Just to come up with a plan would be a great idea. To, um, I thought this would have been better implemented at. Um, the system level because it's a little bit easier to run a pilot at the system level because we're only talking about one one particular item, one particular job, one particular uh, person, and then move from there. However, yeah, well, that's what I had on my agenda, but however, um, that was um, changed. So that was my original plan was to just try it at the system level and then see if it's scalable. So from, I guess, to... Um, if we're going to combine five and six with all the comments to come back with a plan, um, whether it comes from the idea council or whether it comes from this committee, either way, just to have a plan of moving forward. Go ahead. Oh, I see. I got that right this time. <laughs> no, and that was fine. Uh, just for the record, Patty Charlton, uh, officer in charge, just to clarify if we're going to be moving on or discussing the, uh, the charge or the action item is to bring back that and when you reference the idea of council or the system, it's that we bring back a plan and that the chancellor, uh, the chancellor's office and or their designee will bring back a plan on diverse hiring back to this body. I just want to make sure what the charge will be for staff, just to make sure. Because we're combining five and six now, so I yes. just want to make sure. Thank um, you. A plan would be great. Um, and I don't think, do we need to vote on that? It's just, on, because it's just a plan. It's not an action item, I don't believe. On diverse hiring and or blind hiring. Blind hiring. Blind hiring. Okay. So I'm going to ask Director Williams really quick if we do it simply at the system office. And again, I can't go back in, oops, go back in time um, with why the change was made from the system office to uh, UNLV specifically. Is it that that would be then have to be a manual process because we can't implement in, that in Workday? I just want to ask the clarification since you've met with SCS. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so I think it's it's much more doable. Um, if you all can remember, at the time we started these conversations, um, we were in the middle of gearing up for a legislative session. Um, and at the time, myself, I was doing uh, budget work uh, fiscal notes, uh, all of the idea related work. We hadn't hired a wellness officer, so I was staffing the mental health task force. And so um, as as uh, former acting Chancellor Urguiaga stated, we just didn't have the capital. And um, so at that point, we had some conversations. And um, Saval at the time, she she's done a lot of this uh, related work at some pretty prestigious um, academic institutions and she she gracefully 
stepped up to the plate and said she would help. Now, um, at, the, at this point in time, as we know the legislative session is over, um, I don't see why we couldn't do it at the system level, um, but I think that, again, that would have to be a directive to staff to move forward with that. Okay, thank you for the clarification. So thank you. So at this item, since we're, I guess effectively we are tabling it then. Yeah. Uh, Regent Goodman, for the record, I'd like to move to table this item to our next um, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Access Committee meeting. Do I hear a second? Second. Who's got second. <laughs> that was so many seconds. Um, the motion was made by uh, Regent Goodman, and I believe it was seconded by uh, Regent Cruz Crawford. I think Air Scotto was before me, ma'am. Thank oh. you. Okay. Madam Chair. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is Carrie Nikolajewski for the record. Go ahead. Um, I believe I believe that the um, appropriate motion would be a motion to postpone until the next. Um, idea committee meeting, not to table. You are absolutely right. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I would like to restate. Either. I would like to restate my motion. I would like to move that um, we postpone uh, this item five and six, which will be combined as one, to our next inclusion, diversity, equity, access committee meeting. Thank you. And the seconder, who I called as Cruz, uh, Regent Cruz Crawford, do you agree with that? Thank you, yes. Okay, so all in favor of postponing it till the next um, meeting? Aye. Uh, say aye. 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 In, aye. Any opposed? So be it, it's uh, postponed till the next meeting. Thank you. Hmm? And now we're gonna move on to item number eight, WNC Higher Education and Prison Program. And this is for information only. Um, Kathy Morin, adjunct professor at Western Nevada College, will present on the activities um, in the, and initiatives in the WNC Higher Education in Prison Program. Oh, is that the slides? Yeah, okay. No, no, okay. All right. Perfect. Good. Am I okay? Down. <laughs> is that better? Okay. Good. 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 Well, first of all, I just, I am so happy to be here and um, it's a very humbling experience <laughs> to be here and be part of this. I am very passionate about this work. I'll give you a little background on myself. And I know we have a time constraint, but I could sit here and talk about this for hours. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm cognizant of that. I um, am a graduate from UNR. I got my master's in equity and diversity in education two years ago at the age of 60. So, and I mention that because one of my passions working with the prison population is addressing that this is an older population. And I feel, especially in a lot of my graduate work, age wasn't always something we talked about. And we're having an older aging population that is still very vital. And when people find out, you know, I went back later and, and did this, a lot of the response is, oh, I could never do that. Um, you know, I, I couldn't be a student again. But I think we've I've heard it mentioned today. That's part of lifelong learning. And that's one of the things I really share with my students because the average age of an incarcerated man or woman is 40 years old. And they still have another 10 or 20 years on their sentence. So they're coming out older. And I think it's something we always need to keep in the back of our minds. And not only around this, this population, but in our higher, um, higher education institutions. When I went back for my master's, I did the orientation, graduate orientation. And of course, the three oldest people in there, we all gravitated together. And, but we had an interesting conversation about the challenges going back later and doing this. Of course, I was the oldest one in the room, <laughs> but I owned it. I loved it. And it was, it was really enlightening. So 
I share that because that is something I talk to my, my students about. Because one of the things one of my students wrote in their paper was being a student is something they put away years ago, a hat they put away years ago, and they never thought they'd have the opportunity to be a student again. So I don't let age, that that's off the table as far as I'm concerned. Um, they have some other hurdles, but that one I don't, I don't let go by. I teach educational psychology, EPY 150 at Northern Nevada Correctional Center in Carson City. It was my first semester doing this. My master's was in equity and diversity in education. My thesis was the school to prison pipeline. So none of this happens independently of each other. They're very much related. And I'll talk about some of this as we go through the slides. Do I? Oh, no, that's it? That's so technical. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> So, of course, one of my favorite quotes, he who opens a door closes a prison. One of the reasons I have these particular pictures on here is just to give you a little background. The gentleman in the classroom there, that looks very similar to the classroom in which we teach at NNCC. And I mention this because it's actually a luxury. We use their education building. Carson Adult Ed, I have to give a shout out to, has allowed us to come in and use that facility at night and teach within there. But to be in an actual classroom is huge. That's not always the case. A lot of times it's small. I've heard different rooms described different ways, a broom closet. And it's a luxury to have this. And one of the things I really impart with my students from this minute they walk in that door is there a Western Nevada College student first who happens to be taking a class in a prison? They're not a prisoner who's happening to take a college level class. And that distinction is really important to me. And I see how that starts to shift with them too as, as we go through this process. So then let's see, the gentleman in the green, both them were part of the College Behind Bars documentary that Ken Burns did. And if you have not seen it, I encourage you. It's kind of the gold standard. Not all programs look like that, but it's fascinating. And it does give you an insight into this and, and how this works. And it was part of my inspiration of really wanting to, to further this work. I love being an instructor, but I also see this as a much bigger social justice issue. And just the opportunity here to talk about it is part of that social justice. There's a lot of stereotypes and stigma around this population, and it's been a real eye-opener. I also included a picture of the cell there. That's not from an NCC, and normally there's, there's two to a uh, room. They have their units. They're free to move around in their units and do their work or TV. Most of them do work. They work full time. And when they come to class, they look like it. They're tired and it becomes a challenge to keep them engaged. But they do hold full-time jobs. And I included this picture because there's one thing missing in there. There's no desk. So when these students are sitting down late at night, because sometimes that's the only quiet time to do their work, they're literally sitting on the edge of their bed, writing their essays, studying. I had one student tell me there's typically, unless they're in solitary, there's typically two to a room. But his bed was one way, the other, um, his roommate's bed was the other way, and the roommate is sitting there eating potato chips. <laughs> and he was just, you know, it was like nails on a chalkboard. And I just mentioned that because there is a lot of issues that go around them trying to do the work. But they do the work, they do it well, and I'm proud of, of some of the other hurdles within this environment they have to overcome to do that. So, next slide. Next one. Oh, there we go. Thank you. So, just a little context. I'll try to go through this pretty quick because we get short on time. But... The United States, and, and you may know these numbers, but the United States incarcerates 2.2 million people. Sometimes I've seen that number quoted higher, 2.3. Lately, I've actually seen that number lower because during COVID, a lot of prisoners were uh, released, 
low-level prisoners released. So don't let the lower number fool you, because I guarantee you, as we kind of go back into this, that number will, will stay right around that. But we incarcerate more than any other um, industrialized nation in the world. And this is the part in my graduate work that really stuck, and I want to include this, because the estimates suggest that 2.7 million children have a parent who is incarcerated. At some point, more than 5 million children in this country have had a parent in prison or jail. That's 7% of our population. That's huge. That's a huge number. And we don't always think about the ramifications of incarceration. There are families and there are innocent children that are part of this. And I included the last bullet there, and, and again, this was from some of my graduate work, but it all, it's all related. According to the National Institute of Justice, children that have an incarcerated parent are six times more likely to end up in trouble or in prison themselves, typically through no fault of their own. There's a lot of stereotype around this. There's a lot of shame around this. And one of the papers I did talked about these children being the hidden victims because there's no Hallmark card for this. It's not talked about typically in school. Some schools will address, some will not. Typically, people don't know they have an incarcerated either one or two parents in prison or jail. And I mentioned this because I think in one of my next slides, I'll let you go to the next one. That, um, well, I'll get to that, but still talking about context, of course, that black men are six times more likely to be incarcerated than white men, men, and Latinx are two and a half times more likely. Nationally, one in black adults in the United States is serving time in prison. That's a big, big number. Now, the second paragraph talks about, again, this was more from, from elementary school into high school, but blacks, boys, American Indian, Hispanic, Latinos, and students in special education are consistently overrepresented in exclusionary discipline. And I mention this because this is what is feeding the pipeline. This is where they're coming from. When they're suspended and expelled, number one, they're disengaging in school right out of the gate. Number two, that's when they start getting into trouble. And I had the luxury of having a wonderful conversation the last day and through my students' work. They write a lot of essays and it's been humbling to hear their stories. But boys in particular do disengage in school very young. They're over-identified for special education and a lot of that is around behavior. And I can attest to what I heard a lot of my students talk about. They start disengaging by middle school and high school. And that's when the process just kind of goes south from there. So I, I wanted to include this as well, because none of this happens independently of each other, right? Next slide. So... One of, sometimes there's pushback. Why are we educating? Why is this so important? Why are we offering classes to this population? Well, my first and foremost is 95% of men and women incarcerated will be back in our communities. We have to do a better job. And education, obviously, is one of those tools. But 68% will reoffend within the first three years. That's nationally. 73% will reoffend in the state of Nevada. And that's pretty typical, more typical across the board. That is a staggering <laughs> number. So how can we do better? And what can we offer that, that's going to change this cycle? Because it's not just the recidivism there. It's the families and the children of a lot of these, these um, men and women that are incarcerated. Next slide, please. Well, of course, education, right? And it's not a panacea. None of this is, is a panacea, but it's one of the most powerful tools we have to start changing these numbers. So the higher the degree, the lower the recidivism rate. So 14%, if they 
attain an associate degree. It goes from 73, 73 to, or 68 to 73 percent. You'll always get different numbers. But that drops to 14 percent with an associate degree. 5.6 percent for a bachelor's and zero, zero for a master's degree. Recidivism. That's the power of education and what it can do. And one of the conversations I had had with my students is, why, why, why is this important to you? Why, why are you coming back in and wanting to, to go back and get your degree? And a lot of my students have been in and out multiple times. And one of them said something profound. He goes, I want to learn something different. Even though none of us want to be incarcerated, none of us want drug issues, a lot of these men and women, that's been their life. They know that, good or bad, they know that. So to some degree, there's a comfort level in that. So finally, as time goes on, and over time, they do tend to have much more introspection and want to change that cycle. They want to do something different. And he had been at UNR at one point. So some of them had been in college up to, you know, some point in their academic career. Next slide. So, so then there's always dollars and cents, right? So for every dollar spent on prison education, $5 is saved in three-year incarceration rates. Again, sometimes there's pushback with these programs. It's actually very, very cost-effective. And then prisons with college programs, there's, there's the other side of this too, have less violence, uh, not only among the incarcerated individuals themselves, but with, there's less violence with correctional officers, with staff. It really does make a difference. And this is the other one I want to include that shows that children with parents who have college degrees, whether they are incarcerated or not, are more likely to complete college themselves. And again, we're talking about higher education here. This is a population we need to be paying attention to. These kids are missing out, again, a lot of times for no fault of their own. So that's why I just, I, I wanted to touch on that. Next slide, please. So I had shared this, this statistic with my students. 35% of state prisons provide college-level courses. When I first saw that number, I thought, that's a little higher than I probably would have thought. But then when you <laughs> read the second number, that's only serving 6% of incarcerated individuals nationwide. It's a very small percent. And there's multiple reasons. You know, there's, there's a lot of challenges with doing this. But when I told my class this, their eyes got big, and all of a sudden they realized what a really special opportunity this is. And they were really very grateful for it. If I have time, I have at least one I'd like to share when he spoke about his gratitude for the program. And it gave him a great appreciation for what we're doing at WNC and, and actually physically being out in the prison and teaching. I think that is very valuable. While they need to learn technology because there is none in the prison, I think it's vital we are in person doing these courses because there's so many more interpersonal dynamics that happen um, in person, obviously, and, and in a classroom. Next slide. And I, this could be a whole <laughs> another um, uh, presentation, and I'm certainly not an expert on this, but I did want to bring this up because it's been in the news a lot. As of July, Pell Grants have been reinstated for incarcerated men and women. That went away in the 90s. So over for over 30 years, they didn't have access to these funds. That's an iffy number because during COVID, when student loan pause happened, if they were in default or they were going into default, wherever they were in that process, when the payment pause happened, it put those in good standing. So as the payment pause comes, you know, goes away and back to, to paying off student loan debt, that number is probably going to go way down because if they have defaulted on their loans, they cannot um, uh, 
apply for a Pell Grant. And again, I say this too because it's critical in funding. <laughs> this isn't, again, a panacea. There's all this money, everybody gets to go to college. It doesn't work that way. Um, a lot of them have defaulted on their loans. It's, it's a reality of being incarcerated. And not all um, programs offer that as well. But with them increasing the, the amount to the 73.95, that does open it up for, for at least 30,000 more prisoners. But again, it's, it's not a panacea. And there's approximately about 250,000 incarcerated men and women that have defaulted on their loans. So, you know, this, this will be an ongoing, interesting development as we move through this. Next slide. So, again, challenges, right? <laughs> None of this is without its challenges. We just talked a little bit about funding. Um, a lot of our students, and I'll share a quick uh, letter from one of our students. One of my classes, one of my students asked, who can we thank? After I gave him that 6% number, right, that only 6% of incarcerated men and women get to have college classes, he asked, who can we thank for this? And again, it's always from the student you least expect it. And I said, ooh, that's a good question. So I found out several of them wanted to write thank you notes and letters because they were receiving um, scholarships to, to be able to do this. So I'll, I'll share one. But funding is always, right? That's always an issue. The other big issue actually is facilities. Even growing the program, you're still limited by the amount of space within a prison, the, you know, the rooms, um, and some prisons just don't have that, that access. Also, some are very rural. How do you get out there? How do you have teachers come out there? Again, you know, technology, which is on the list, is one of, one of the hurdles. But one of the real interesting, and again, I had wonderful opportunity to, to sit the last day of class and have a fascinating conversation with my students, <laughs> because one of the challenges teaching in a prison, it was the last day of class, was giving them, them gr their grades, and I had this wonderful, you know, dramatic end, and thank you, thank you, and they all just were sitting there staring at me. I'm like, y'all can go. And they said, no, we can't, because they hadn't finished count. <laughs> so they can't leave. They cannot leave the classroom. They can't go anywhere until the whole prison has been counted for. So I said, okay, good. I have you here. Let me pick your brain. And we got into a really interesting conversation about the stigma and stereotypes around a lot of these individuals. And yes, there are some that should never return to society. And some that I sit in the gate or wait in the gatehouse before I go into the classroom. And some of the stories I hear, some I don't want to hear. But there's just some that cannot function in society. But that is a still a very small percentage. And a lot of them are, you know, they're realizing as they continue their journey and look for jobs, there's a stigma and stereotype around this population. The longer, at least in my very limited experience, the longer they're incarcerated, the more they have mellowed. Not, not one of my students ever felt sorry for himself. They all owned it and owned what they did. So to have this opportunity, I told them I wish more people could have the opportunity to walk in and see this. The general public doesn't. Um, and for me, that's part of this social, bigger social justice issue, is to be able to talk about this. It's not what you see on TV. Um, yes, there's some very violent prisons. It's not, you know, I'm very grateful for, for where we get to do this. But it was a really interesting conversation. The other big issue is staffing, not only as instructors in the college. It's very labor intensive, by the way. Um, every student that signs up, it's, it's manually entered into the college as they're registering. So it's very labor and time um, consuming. So staffing is always an issue, but it's also an issue within the prison. Um, we have to, ha we have one dedicated, there's two of us on the nights I teach, two of us teaching classes. We have one dedicated CO, correctional officer, and he, you know, he's there if we need him. But staffing's an issue, and sometimes class is late because they're shifting staffing around so we can be brought in and go, go teach our classes. And of course, consistency. It's so important that programs, if we're offering these programs, we're consistent with them, and these men and women have the opportunity to actually finish, finish what they started. 
So if I can, if, real quick, I'd love to share. You can go to the next slide. And it, it says in their words, because I could never, they, they're writing, the fun part of being an instructor, as a lot of us know, is to see the growth from the beginning, especially when they think they couldn't do it to the end when they've actually done it. And their very last project is they have to stand up and give a presentation. And when I told my students this the first day or two, I saw the fear of God in their eyes. And these are some guys that have done some, some stuff. So to see them come through that at the end and be able to stand up and do it. And today I can't wait to share this experience with them <laughs> because it reminds me Fear of speaking is number one, death is number two. So <laughs> that is something I share with them. This is from one of my, my students. Um, Thank you so much for making the Western Nevada College program at Northern Nevada Correctional Center possible. To our own detriment, many of us students didn't take advantage of the educational programs offered by our local community colleges and universities prior to incarceration. If we had, our lives may have been different. I enjoy the challenges of learning new things. This semester I had EPY. The teacher taught the class from a lecture platform, not relying entirely on books. It was enlightening and informative. Whether students, including myself, are learning welding or taking one of the classes taught in the education program, we get to step away from the prison environment. It is difficult to explain how this affects our psyche to be able to get away even for a couple of hours every week. And I share his paper because I heard that across the board from my students. In closing, thank you. Your donations help change lives and reduce the chances someone will reoffend. The inmates that dedicate their time and energy to the college program are the inmates least likely to return to prison once released. Questions? <laughs> Thank you, that was very informative. Uh, Regent, or Vice Chair, McMichael has a question. Yes, uh, uh, Vice Chair McMichael, uh, for the record. My question I have is, is this considered uh, an incentive program uh, or rehabilitation for these uh, individuals who are incarcerated? They are incentivized. It does help with, they. well, first of all, they have to be discipline-free. I mean, there's some points they have to hit. They have to be discipline-free for at least a year. I lost five of my students because of discipline issues, not within the classroom, but other things that happen. So they are incentivized. It will help reduce their sentence if they're taking college-level courses. Thank and you. yes, I, I would, yeah, I think it's rehabilitative too, as most of them never finished their, they have to have their high school diploma before they obviously can enroll in these courses, just like, you know, in, on campus. Um, but yes, I think it, it obviously, it, it's changed a lot of, a lot of them, so. Thank you. Moving You're to, welcome. Thank you. Moving to um, Regent Goodman. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say I, I really commend you for your work, and this is a great program. Uh, I was working with reducing recidivism rates at the city in the early 2000s with our city of Las Vegas Neighborhood Services Department, and this work is so incredibly important. I just wanted to know, are you, it seems like it would be a viable pathway for you to maybe work with um, the Hope for Prisoners program um, that John Ponder runs. Oh, you name it. <laughs> but like, you know, once they get out yeah. of, of, you know, with this education, yeah. they, it, it, well, there's just so much opportunity. You bring up an excellent point is this is all fine and dandy. Reentry is another, I don't care if you have a degree or not, reentry is a huge, huge hurdle. It helps. One of the, the podcasts I was listening to was a gentleman that had gotten his, I think his PhD, but he was talking about that if you don't have your education, it's like merging onto a highway on a tricycle. And I thought that was a great analogy. So at least an education gets them up to speed. Doesn't mean it's a brand new Ferrari that's going to get them there, but it does offer that. Um, and yes, reentry is is a huge hurdle as well. 
Are, are you working? Are you working with that program, though? Do you do you know that program? No, no. Okay, I'll forward you some of that information. It's a really great reentry program, like and um, yeah. I just think it um, provides great pathways for for these individuals. Good. It's and that's important. It's all part of the process. So good. Super, thank thank you. you. Thank you for that. Um, Anything President else? Dalby. Yes, thank you, Kyle Dalby, president of Western Nevada oh. College. I want to chime in with a uh, comment. Um, Kathy, thank you so much for putting this uh, presentation together, but even more so for being part of our um, prison education program and, and doing uh, what you need to do to be able to teach in there. I also want to throw a shout out to Deb Conrad, who's hiding off camera in Reno, who runs yeah. this program. <laughs> She's a back of, there. <laughs> a, lot of, uh, a lot of time and energy that goes into this and the yes. department by the Department of Corrections has supported us. And I, yes. it, it's one of those that providing the access um, helps these uh, these students um, when, with their career path um, inside and outside when they come out and, and re-entry yes. is a big thing, helping them and then they don't have to go back. So we appreciate the work and I appreciate the comments. And some of the regents have attended the commencements. You'll all, you'll all get an invite next year if you want to come and do a commencement in the prison. And it's, it's a very rewarding experience. So thank you for having us on the agenda today. Yes, thank you. And you do bring, I just want to reiterate too about, um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, well, you said it. Ditto, as the other gentleman said earlier. <laughs> It'll come back. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, kind of echo what I've been hearing. Uh, thank you for what you do. Yes, Deb, kudos, kudos. And um, dial mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dalfi, you need to give her a big raise. Like 12%. <laughs> you heard that. We have witnesses. <laughs> um, but this program, um, it, it just gives back to the community. It, it is a wonderful program. I wish we offered more um, degrees for the women's side. Um, yeah. Uh, because that's one of the things that we're lacking. The, women, uh, the women's side typically tries to go into cosmetology or some um, hyper, uh, typically female dominated fields. Yeah, whereas, gender role. Yeah, general. With, um, but with the males, they can go into um, more uh, lucrative more or better paying jobs. So I would just wish that would, we could shift that so that the women's prison is offered, the women's uh, is offered the same thing as the men's. That's my own. And I thank you no. both for what you do, you and Deb. Um, the state owes you, a, you know, it's wow. to decrease, I, I know I get all um, excited because to, to decrease recidivism, <laughs> is one of the, you know, $1 basically in education can save you $5 on the other end. That's just yeah. phenomenal. And I well, and I think there's, there's that, I'm sorry to interrupt, but talk about excited. I, you know, this is my passion and I'm so grateful later in life I got to pursue it. But um, yeah, the dollars and cents and it is important because and I, I, one of the things I wanted to mention was the support of the De Department of Corrections, too, out there. They've been very supportive with us in whatever we need, whenever we need it. And that is important because, you know, again, it goes back to some stigma around this. But that is, I wanted to shout out on that, too. So thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? From Reno. Regent Arascata. Okay, go ahead, Regent Arascata. Thank you very much. That was so well done. Well, uh, thank you. A <laughs> couple of items I'd really like to hear in the future is slide number three and slide number four. Um, you have national statistics on this. If you could bring us back something with Nevada statistics. Yeah, it's, yeah. That'd it be gets a little convoluted sometimes to find some of that, but absolutely. And once again, as, as I stated, this was a great report. But being the items that were presented, the material that were presented are academic programs, and they may be best be heard from in the ARSA, under the scope of ARSA, academic research and student affairs. So in the future, if we can follow up and circle back on the future with that, that'd be wonderful. I appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. Great suggestion. And good. if there's no more questions, Very good. thank you right. again. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Um, let's see. And now we're moving to item number nine, the idea council cap, idea council campus activity update, and that will be done by Mr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Tillery Williams, Director of Community Engagement, Equity, and Inclusion. I will try to do my best Angela Holt impression today because she cannot be here with us. 
Um, I'm already lacking with the hair, so I will just uh, start. <laughs> so before I start sharing all of the effective and exciting uh, idea-related work that institutions are engaging in, um, I would like to thank the Idea Council, which is made up of our um, campus chief diversity officers, for all of the guidance and support it has provided me with during my time in this role. I always try to thank uh, the Idea Council for their work because they make my job much easier. And all of those guys have become not just great colleagues, but friends that I can count on. Um, and, and, and as we know, with all of the current political and cultural divides present in many communities across this nation, the individuals serving in these roles have very challenging jobs to do, but also very important and, rewar and rewarding work. Um, and they, they occupy these positions every single day, regardless of how challenging it is. Um, and so without the hard work and dedication of, of the IDEA Council, NSHE and its institutions would have a very big void to fill. So thank you again for your commitment to inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. With that being said, I will start with UNR as the first update. Um, many, many units from the University of Nevada, Reno co-sponsored and collaborate Co collaboratively co celebrated the 2023 Northern Nevada Pride Parade and Festival this year for its biggest sponsorship yet as a university. Uh, UNR's Latino Research Center will host its first Latino parent open house on Saturday, August 19th from 6 to 7 p.m. And diversity and inclusion along with counseling and many other departments are getting ready for their Nevada Fit Week of welcoming incoming freshmen. UNR has relatively new sensory items available for checkout at its libraries and is in the process of finalizing its 11th uh, lactation and quiet room on campus and is happy to welcome its new Title IX director, Ziva Edmondson. Uh, moving on to Great Basin College. Great Basin College is in the process of scheduling a series of September LGBTQIA plus train the trainer sessions with Kyle Strobel from Truckee Meadows Community College as a follow-up to its camp campus-wide LGBTQIA plus training offered in May. Over the summer, GBC has also been hosting a community drum circle led by Shoshone drummer, Jeremiah Jones. At Western Nevada College, um, the Western Nevada College DE DEI committee, along with the CREST program and Dis Disability Support Services, co-sponsored a motivational speaking event on Tuesday, August 8th led by Zach Goen, a professional WWE wrestler. Zach lost his dad at a young age and his left leg to cancer at eight years old. He almost lost his life to drugs in his 20s. His message is, sometimes you have to lose everything to find yourself. And those are pretty powerful words. Zach now travels the world sharing his message of hope and empowerment to individuals of all backgrounds. The WNC DEI committee is also working with Kyle Strobel to bring the Nevada Department of Health and Human Services grant funded Safe Zone LGBTQIA plus education to faculty and staff during the fall 23 semester. The no cost presentations and workshops will consist of basic level and up to date LGBTQIA plus information, issues, terminology, protections, as well as helpful examples of best practices. Uh, at TMCC, Latinx enrollment is up uh, at 34.27% uh, uh, as of right now. TMCC is also planning its uh, to be in Venita event for September 13th. Juana uh, Reynosa Gomez, TMCC's Program Director for Equity, Inclusion, and Sustainability is presenting at this year's NC Southern um, Nevada Diversity Summit being hosted at CSN. Lastly, TMCC is in the process of hiring a new coordinator in the Office of Equity, Inclusion, and Sustainability. Part of this position will be dedicated to working with our Native American slash indigenous students. Moving along to DRI, in early July, DRI's IDEA Committee welcomed its new core uh, cohort of community members which is comprised of a combination of new and returning members. Also in July, the IDEA Committee at DRI hosted Kyle Strobel from TMCC, 
for a train to train presentation uh, on the LGBTQIA plus community. Open to, I, uh, open to idea committee members only, this training provided a deeper understanding and appreciation of LGBTQIA plus people. Finally, the D DRI idea committee is organizing an upcoming social event in either September or October. And lastly, Nevada State submitted recommendations in a configuration guide for the training component of the board's anti-bias and anti-discrimination policy adapted, uh, adopted at last September's board meeting in Elko. Nevada State will also be opening a multicultural, uh, multicultural center, center this fall, and it will be called the Multicultural Collective. Nevada State invites our regents to celebrate with them at the grand opening on September 21st, um, 2023. And um, in conclusion, the Nevada State Office of Community Equity, Diversity and Inclusion team is finalizing its slate of programs for 23-24, which will include various trainings, film screenings, author visits, and other events. Madam Chair, that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions about those remarks? Seeing none, we're going to move forward to new business. Is there any new business? Okay. New business? Uh, sure, go ahead, Regent Arascada. Uh, thank you, Chair Perkins. I'm just following up on a previous new business item that I submitted, um, and it's in regards to the IDEA Council. I think it would, be, it would definitely behoove this entire committee and possibly the entire board um, to get a little bit more of, a, of the body of the IDEA Council. Um, what are their terms? How many members are part of that council? Uh, equal representation on each campus. Is the membership uh, notification posted in the diversity representative offices on each campus? Are students from underrepresented uh, population on each campus? Do they have an opportunity to have a voice and or a seat at the table and which institutions have personnel on that council. If we would follow up on that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, done. Any other new business? Um, I think something from earlier was um, to disaggregate the uh, faculty, the data versus um, the component, like the, the components do we get that one? Yes. Yeah, so, um, Chair Perkins, yes. What I had uh, written down was to disaggregate our employee data by different uh, classifications, yes. uh, classified uh, faculty and staff. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. You made it make sense. Thank you. You read my mind. Um, let's see. Something. Thank you, Chair Perkins, for for adding that. I I was I was going to mention that. Um, that I do see that it's part of the Idea Council's priorities for, for this year, um, but I appreciate you adding that to new business. Thank you. Thank you. You teed it up for me. Okay. And um, I guess that's it. Um, so with no, no new business, no other... Go ahead. Yes, we're moving on to public comment. Any public comment in Elko? There is no public comment in Alco. Any public comment in Reno? There is no public comment in Reno. Thank you. Any public comment in Las Vegas? And I see no public comment. No, I'm just easy. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I wasn't going to say anything, but just because of some comments that were made earlier, Bill Robinson, for the record, um, not speaking to you as the chair of the UNLV Faculty Senate, but speaking to you as a donor to women's athletics at UNLV, um, one of the senior volleyball and basketball referees in this state, uh, somebody who donates his time and his effort to uh, the women's side of the house at UNLV. Uh, first, the salary issue. We live in a country where well over half of the states, the highest paid public employees, either the head football coach or the head basketball coach at one of the universities. There is a free market for uh, coaches, and UNLV pays low market salaries, but they pay market salaries. Is Lindy LaRock uh, worth a whole lot more than she gets yes so is she gonna we're gonna see what happens when people start trying to hire her away and whether the university um, commits to that but their women's coaches have brought suit against their universities many times and they always lose because the market is what the what the the market is unfortunately um, 
There is the issue of the EADA, which rightfully belongs under this committee, the equity and diversity report that goes to the federal government every year from every athletic program. Um, it used to be that UNLV separated out its sports so you could actually get a P&L, a profit and loss from each sport. They stopped doing that. Every sport breaks even. So the last time they did it the old school way, there was a, we knew that football lost three and a half million dollars. We knew that basketball made a lot of money. We knew that softball actually did better than baseball. We, you can't tell that anymore. What that report does tell us is things like the athletics department gives male athletes more money when they're on the road than female athletes. It, gives the female coaches more money to recruit her student athlete than it gives the female side of the house. So there's inequities there. And the way we meet our Title IX quotas is uh, track girls count three times. So the track team is the, yes, the track team is the cross country team, the indoor track team and the outdoor track team. So those 35 women count as 105. We count those as 105 athletes against our total and they counterbalance the football team. And that's how we balance our uh, Title IX obligations, which is pretty interesting as well. Um, you should have Harp in here. I harass him all the time because how we treat women's sports, both fan experience, uh, their investment in them, it's, it's just not, not commensurate with the fact that they're the only championship teams on campus, the volleyball team, the, the basketball team, and the women's tennis team. Um, the other thing is, if you, if you ever watched um, Regent Tarkanian's husband's teams, they always had local kids on their team. In addition to the fact they were recruiting the best kids from around the country, they always had some, some local kids on there. And a women's basketball team, three of the five starters were last year local kids, but two of them have now graduated. We don't put that emphasis anymore on um, recruiting within our local base. And I think we ought to do that. Thanks. Thank you for those comments. Any other comments in Las Vegas? Uh, Regent, uh, I'm sorry, Vice Chair Mike Michael. Yes, uh, 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 for the record, uh, Regent Donald McMichael, M-C-M-I-C-H-A-E-L, and that's senior. Uh, my public comment has to deal with the uh, Nevada Election Board. It seems to me that uh, for some reason, because you're nonpartisan, you don't fall into the a D or R group, and you're not counted. I'm thinking that those 10,000 voters that were not cured were all nonpartisan, and the Nevada Election Board needs to see to it that we have a nonpartisan representative curing those 10,000. We cannot have 10,000 voters uh, just left in the dark because they don't have an R or a D uh, on the ballot uh, that is not representative, uh, uh, re showing representation in this community, in this state. Uh, we, uh, or the nonpartisan voters, are the fastest group that are voting in this state, and they've already overtaken the Democrats as far as, as the number. We cannot have people just going off into the ether because they don't have an R or D. They don't have to fall into a certain category in order to be counted. These people took the time and effort to submit their votes, and they're being uh, left behind simply because they don't fall into the R or the D category and no one wants to take that up because they might be disadvantaged by doing so. These people took the time to vote. Their vote needs to count. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all for hanging in there. This is a long meeting but a lot of important work being done.